soldier crabs marching. Imagine taking a stroll in the ocean and stumbling upon this sight. Instead of white sand, you see thousands and thousands of tiny crabs marching about. This makes it look like crabs are starting to invade the entire beach, but it's just how blue crabs are. You see, these creatures are no bigger than your thumb, and as their name suggests, they boast a striking blue color. These tiny armored critters, also known as Mctyrus longicarpus, are the petite parades of Australia's sandy beaches. Donned in vibrant blue armor, they're hard to miss despite their small size. That's because, as you can see in this clip, they have a penchant for gathering and marching together. But why exactly do they like doing this? Why do they like congregating on beaches? These creatures gather because of a habit known as swarming. By swarming, these crabs create what's known as a dilution effect. When they're in large groups, individual crabs have a lower chance of being singled out by predators. Essentially, their safety in numbers. The swarming also has to do with their feeding habits. Blue soldier crabs are detritivores, which means they feed on organic material found in the sand. With their tiny clawed appendages, they filter the sand for food. And when you have a whole army working together, the beach becomes an all-you-can-eat buffet. Number 16. Those remind me of the, the little, tiny, little, baby, little-looking crabs you find in, like, oysters. Have you ever popped open an oyster? That just made me hungry by saying popped open an oyster because I've been wanting oysters lately. But anyway, if you ever popped open an oyster and come across, it don't happen all the time, come across a little, small, little baby crab in there, that's what that reminds me of. Crab building its house. Be careful while walking along the seashore because you might just destroy a construction site. And by that, I mean a crab building its home on the sandy beaches. Just take a look at this fella expertly building its new home bit by bit. Now we wouldn't want this little crab's hard work to go to waste, right? I'm also pretty sure that if someone were to step on his new home, he wouldn't hesitate to use his tiny pincers. Number 15. Baby Sea Turtle Spawning Now this is a magical moment that many of us get the chance to witness in person. As you can see in this burrow, a batch of baby sea turtles have hatched, and this moment marks the beginning of their long and arduous journey. Their first mission is to waddle their way to the ocean and let themselves get taken by the waves. You can see some of them are struggling, but they know where the water is. You see, the life of a sea turtle isn't easy. You can see dozens of them in this video, but only a small fraction of these guys will survive. Out of every 1,000 hatchlings, only about one or two will reach adulthood. They face numerous challenges, from predators like birds and crabs to the threats posed by human activity. Once they hit the water, the real journey begins. These little turtles will spend the next few years in the open ocean, growing and learning to survive. As they grow, They'll migrate vast distances, facing countless adventures and challenges along the way. Females will eventually return to the very beach they were born on decades later to lay their own eggs, and the incredible cycle of life will continue. Pretty touching to see these creatures, huh? That's why we should work hard to protect the oceans and their habitats. Number 14. Weird Exploding Sea Creatures Now this is a pretty old video, but to this day, I still can't quite comprehend what exactly happened in this video. You can see a group of friends exploring the beach. In the distance, they saw a group of red creatures stuck to a nearby rock. But before they could approach it to get a better look, the creatures disappeared behind the rock one by one. Unfettered, the group continued searching around the beach, and after climbing high up the cliff, they finally spotted one of the bizarre red creatures on top of the rock formation near the ocean. They decided to poke one using a stick, and quite frankly, it looked like a giant slug. But when they turned it over, it was clear that it was unlike any creature they'd ever seen before. Now, I'm no biologist, but I know that this creature looks far too weird. It looked like it had its mouth beneath its body. Now, you would think that seeing a creature so strange would scare or spook these guys. But nope, they decided to fool around and pour a bottle of soda into the creature's mouth. What happened next was unexpected. This one guy wanted to get a better look, but it immediately proved to be a mistake when the sea creature began gushing out a powerful jet of liquid right into the guy's face before exploding. Some say this is just a parody video created an entire decade ago, but some say that this creature exists somewhere in Japan. 
The sulfur industry is worth nearly $13 billion globally, but the workers who risk their lives to mine it in an active volcano make just $17 a day. <laughs> what? Why? Because there's a demand for this important ingredient in sugar, and that's a pretty decent wage for the area. If you look at other booming industries, you'll see the same trend. From collecting acai for our smoothie bowls to harvesting our table salt, people risk life, lung, and limb to make a buck in these billion dollar industries. We journey around the world to see what it's like working some of the most dangerous jobs on the planet. In East Java, Indonesia, hundreds of miners face deadly smoke to extract sulfur, or devil's gold. Sulfur is used in everything from matches, fireworks, and gunpowder to detergent, paper, and batteries. It's what makes our sugar white. Working conditions inside Ijin Volcano are so dangerous, many miners don't live past 50 years old. Nama saya Mister. Saya sebagai penambang belirang di Kawa Ijen. Miners like Mistar carry up to 200 pounds of sulfur on their backs, up and down these steep cliffs. And mistar has been doing it for 30 years. This is as far as Mistar can go on his bike. There are no roads to the crater, so he has to walk the rest of the way. It's a two-mile hike up to the ridge of Ijin Volcano. Listen, man. <laughs> Wait till these guys realize, and I'm not saying they don't know their worth, but when they band together and realize how much of a uh, th how much they're needed, how much this operation can't go on without them, they gon' they yeah, they gonna get what they they worth and deserve, man. Cause this isn't right, bro, at all, at all. You heard the life expectancy. You heard how much work they putting in, and they're not even seeing a fraction. Not even a fraction. Like this is this is. Man, this is, I ain't gonna lie, this is, this is kind of making me up. This pissed me off. This for real. He takes only his basket and a crowbar down into the thousand foot deep crater. Here, he faces the volcano's extreme environment. The air can reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And he works near one of the world's most toxic volcano lakes. And there's the smoke. Kalau asap masuk dalam tubuh itu merasakan sesak, nyeri di hulu hati, sesak nyeri. The miners are freelance contractors, so they have to pay for their own gear, and many can't afford gas masks. Instead, they use handkerchiefs or towels dipped in water to keep the sulfur powder from sticking. Bau asap belirang itu sangat menyengat. Bau asam lagi kadang-kadang bau go seperti gorengan telur. Tapi kalau masuk dalam hidung atau mulut itu sesak. Ini mas batu ini mas. But the smoke from inside the volcano is crucial for sulfur production. This is how it works. When the super hot smoke hits the cooler air outside, it condenses liquid and drips off the pipe. As it solidifies and cools, the sulfur will turn yellow and miners can begin chipping off blocks. It's the sulfur's two colors that give it the name Devil's Gold. 
Once he fills his baskets, Mistar hoists them up on his shoulder to hike back. But that sulfur is not a light load. Kalau saya maksimalnya mikul, itu satu pikulan 70 kilo. That's about 154 pounds. Mistar himself weighs just 132. Nama punggung ya pasti sakit mas di sini kalau berat. Kan kadang-kadang di pundaknya itu kan sampai rusak, ngapal itu rusak. Itu kadang ada tumbuh-tumbuhan yang seperti jerawat itu. Itu penyakitnya kalau orang mikul. They have to haul it up the steep walls of the crater. Langsung, naik, pelan-pelan. Soalnya kalau nanti kerasa berusuh, malah bahaya ke diri sendiri. Jadi jatuh. Mulai saya jatuh. Once he reaches the rim of the crater, Mistar can transfer the sulfur to his trolley and begin the two miles back. Menimbangan, langsung timbang. Nanti berapa dapat per kilonya, selesai itu uh, diturunkan, langsung dinaikkan mobil. The mining company pays on the weight of their loads. They get about nine cents per kilo. With two loads, Mistar can make $17 a day. At the end of the day, Mistar returns home to eat dinner with his family and rest. Look at him. He looks wore out. And got to turn around and get up and do this whole thing again at 1, 1, 2 a.m. What, bro? Like, you can see the way his posture is, how he's laid back. He probably got a pillow behind him. Trying to comfort his back after just carrying up something that was well over his body weight. Like, no. Like, come on, man. Pay these guys more. Ejin looms over them, a symbol of how Mistar provides for his family's lives, while it slowly takes his, a heavy weight to carry on his shoulders. India is one of the world's largest salt producers, and roughly a third of it comes from deep in this desert. Today, thousands of families live here, farming salt by hand. They're known as the Agarillas, and they've been salt producers in this harsh environment for generations. Each year, they arrive at the dry, cracked land of the little round of Kutch in October. Patadia Gugabai and his wife carry everything they'll need to live in the desert for the next six months, including supplies to make their huts, clothes, farming tools, and all their food and water. अने अत्यारे उन रण मारो सु कारण के आवाज़ आओ मतो मोगवारी प्रमाण तो जो अधी तो गनु उल्लू थे कि मोगवारी वधी गई थी इतने आये रण मार रण मार रही है जी। First, they have to find the key to this whole operation: salty brine water underground. They dig 30 feet into the mud to get to it. The families then set up these government-subsidized solar panels. They'll power the pumps that bring brine water to the surface. Then, the Agarias build the salt pans, these expansive salt flats. The roller helps them flatten out the earth. They'll make 10 to 20 pans, all by hand. It's back-breaking work. Then the farmers will release the salty brine water from the wells. It flows between the pans. By the last pan, the water reaches the 24% salinity needed to form big salt crystals. Over the next few months, as the water evaporates, salt crystals form. Wow. <laughs> They start raking early each morning to avoid the hottest part of the day. But working here can be really dangerous. The life expectancy of a farmer is about 60 years because not only do they face extreme temperatures, they are dealing with subsoil brine which is highly acidic. And you also, and exposure to that subsoil brine also comes with a lot of uh, problems in, in skin. 
અમને તો પેલા તો સાંભળી ના રોગ થાય છે એટલે એક મહિના લગી તો રૂજ જ ન આવે અને સાંભળી નો રોગ પેલો જ કારણ કે પેલા પેનિયા થી ને શરૂ થાય Many of the Agaryas become blind from years of the bright sun reflecting off the white landscape and because they're so far from the nearest village accessing medical care is often too expensive. Amar nana jo aur the mithi soti giyu ne te bangta tha ane imne pagge jan ki phol ki dai ne pasi mitha ma to ruj aave nahi ran ma pag pasi kai po kai po pasi 3 divas jiva 3 divas pasi death ho gayi Despite these conditions, the Agariyas live and work out here until spring, when the salt is finally ready. They harvest three times. The first produces the best quality salt. They leave in April, usually with over a thousand tons of salt. And most farmers we spoke to said that this season's market price for salt is between two and four dollars per ton. That means in a good year a family will earn about $2000 for months of grueling work. That's well below the poverty line. તો મીઠું વેચવા જઈએ ત્યારે જાણે વેપારી સંગઠન કરી અને એ ભાવ નક્કી કરે એ ભાવ અમને આપે. Most of the world's acai comes from This world is backwards, man. This world is backwards. Do you think you can do that job? Back breaking and during the temperatures. The health effects different things that you're going to come across and have to deal with which you know you need this because you saw he has a family he has a little girl out there probably got to pay for school if he has enough the money to even do that but he got to take care of him he got to feed him like how do, like there's no way you can make this make sense the scales is tipped we need to balance everything back out man the uh, This is why our planet and our world is going bad right here. This is one of the reasons. Look at how they're doing people. Deep in the Amazon rainforest, people here risk climbing 50 foot high palm trees to harvest the fruit. Ela pode chegar lá em cima no pegar do cacho, ela quebrar, no meio que ela é frágil. These berries have become one of the most popular so-called superfoods in the US, and they aren't cheap. One bowl can cost up to $15. And while the berry has exploded in popularity in recent decades, small farms like this haven't really been able to cash in. A gente fica com a menor parte do lucro aqui na comunidade, né? His family's farm is roughly 70 miles from Belém, the capital of the state of Pará, which grows more than 90% of the açaí produced in Brazil. The only tool they used to climb is a single piece of rope called a piconha. They used to be made of leaves. Essa folha aqui, a gente pegava, torcia ela. Aí passava por aqui, fazia isso. Para ver como como o tempo vai mudando, né? Today, Lucas's son Luis Fernando will go up. Se tiver só pônei que tiver maduro, não tá que preparou. Pode subir, vai com cuidado. The trunks are so thin that climbers have to be lightweight. É perigoso o cara tá lá em cima e o mar vai quebrar. É riscado o cara quebrar o braço, quebrar pé. At the top, they swing from the tree to reach multiple bunches. Going down can be dangerous too, especially while carrying a large knife and holding an armful of branches. Dropping them could damage the fragile fruit. Graças a Deus eu nunca caí dessa zeira. Quero que isso não aconteça comigo. Eu já caí três vezes dessa zeira. Não me bati nenhuma vez, graças a Deus. Lucas and his family harvested 53 baskets like these in 2021, earning them an income of about 
That's as little as 20 cents per pound. Meanwhile, a pound of processed acai sorbet can sell for $7 or more in the U.S. Part of the issue is that Lucas has to sell his acai as soon as possible because the fruit goes bad fast. That leaves farmers who don't have processing machines with little leverage to negotiate. Não tem empresa aqui na nossa comunidade. A gente vende para atravessador para poder chegar na mão daquelas pessoas que vão beneficiar, que vão se dar bem. Merchants bring the acai to Belang by boat. It's a race against the clock to sell the fruit before it spoils, so markets run overnight. Some acai gets transported to processing facilities like North Acai. Every day, 22 tons of fruit are turned into frozen pulp, the acai that most people outside of Pará are familiar with. Indigenous people living in the Amazon have harvested and consumed acai for centuries, maybe even millennia. The Brazilian government estimates there are nearly 6,000 quilombola communities in the country. And a 2013 study found roughly 75% still lived in extreme poverty. Mas é uma, uma comunidade rica. Né? A gente se diz assim pobre, mas se torna rico né? de espírito. This isn't snow. It's limestone. And miners risk their lives to carve it out of the white quarries of Egypt. The valuable rock is at the center of a huge industry. And it's used to make everything from cement and glass to plastic and tiles. It's even what the Great Pyramids were made out of. Yep. But digging up and cutting... That's exactly what I was sitting here thinking about was the pyramids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The pyramids. Thinking about how it possibly once looked. And this could be a glimpse in onto how they did it. Uh, uh, how they designed it or how they built it up and what they used. This right here, glimpse into it. Precious blocks is really dangerous. For these guys, each day starts in Nina City at dawn. And this is where the danger begins. These trucks aren't meant for passengers. Workers have gotten injured from falls along the winding journey. The trip to the mountain takes about 40 minutes. Uh -huh. Then it's time to get suited up. Since these miners are freelancers, they have to buy their own protective gear. Often, homemade cloth masks, gloves, and sunglasses are all miners have to shield them. They grab their tools and descend into the pit. First, miners have to set up these two rails. Two separate machines roll along the tracks. They slice the stone into perfect cuboids beneath. The machines move quickly. They're really heavy and they're loud. Workers shout at each other to warn the machines are nearby. Because the real hazard is those saws. A quick step is all that separates miners from razor sharp blades. Miners are responsible for fixing the machines when they break. Bro just said you should keep your eye on the rotating blade. Meaning, if you lose the limb, that's on you. You should have been watching. We ain't got time for this. No. And they, and we already know they ain't got no health insurance or nothing like that. So you, you do that, you just done. You, you go on, somebody else probably take over on your job. And that's just the way it goes out there. Gotta keep your eye on the rotating blade. What? and sharpening the blades by hand. That's also risky work. The cutting machines used to have coverings, but they fell off years ago. Now the blades are exposed. As the machines cut stone, they kick up rocks in a haunting white cloud of limestone powder. If there's no wind, miners disappear in it like ghosts. It's easy to inhale the fine dust. And if they breathe it long enough, it can cause a lung condition called silicosis. Oh. 
حساسيه من البودره دي اصعب شغله دي في الصيف بالنسبه لي مفيش هوا Injuries, sickness, and death in these mines are widely reported, but there aren't any official numbers. At one point, the life expectancy here was just 45 years old. في ناس زرعتها تقطعت من الموس. في ناس دماغ خلا مغزى الموس دخل فيها ماتت. ناس كتير بعيد عنك تقطع تردلا. Zaki says many mine owners will offer under $200 by way of workers' comp. التعويض ما يسكرش. بالنسبة لي لما تقطع رجل وما تقطع ايد الرجل يتعوض ولا الرجل يتعوض ما يتعوضش. Perfectly cut stones that haven't been sold yet get stacked. But these blocks have already been purchased. So miners throw them straight into the truck. And they have perfect aim. If they're lucky, they might get a $3 stipend for food and tea on top of their $6 daily wage. These jokers here are the real NBA and NFL players right here. These jokers step onto a court or an NFL field. They might be the best thing on the field. Did you just see how accurate they were with those bricks? Ac I mean, accuracy. Like, you don't see that often. <laughs> These men are climbing slippery limestone cliffs, risking falls of up to a hundred feet. <laughs> They're looking for a rare nest made of bird saliva that's found inside caves across Southeast Asia. In the Philippines, the harvesters are known as bushadors. Ako si Alvin Villarindo, isa akong busyador ng pangalan at Nabat Island. For centuries, Alvin Villarindo's family have put their lives on the line to gather swiftlet nests. Just two pounds is worth $2,900. And it's used to make a soup that locals believe is good for your health. Alvin and his crew gather at Bangalan Point on Mighty Git Island. <laughs> and they're heading to Nabat Island. It's one of the 7,000 islands that make up the Philippines, and it can only be reached by boat. They get off the boat and walk barefoot across the slippery and sharp rocks. They make the ladder as they're climbing up. They tighten the bamboo with rope. Then they attach a piece of wood called kalitang to the ladder. Yung pinakamahirap gawin talaga yan, yung pag-akyat. Siyempre, hindi mo pa alam kung maganda yung pagkasabit ng kalitang. Ba, sinabit. Tapos, hindi mo hindi sure kung anong pagkalagay nun doon. Kaya medyo sa pag-akyat mo, medyo alanganin ka pa, baka biglang matanggal. The stakes are high. Have you ever worked in like any type of warehouse or anything? What's the one thing that the warehouse is scared of? Who who popping in that they're always scared of? OSHA, OSHA. Like all I see throughout this video is OSHA violations, man. <laughs> Just OSHA violations everywhere. OSHA can't watch this video. Tignan namin sa mga tao sa baba na mga kasama namin para mga bata na lang. Tinitignan ko yung ano na sabi ko, kunting pagkakamali lang talaga pag nalaglag, puro bato yung mababagsakan mo. Pag hindi na sa kondisyon yung katawan, huwag natin piliting umakyat kasi siyempre buhay natin yung nakataya dyan. But advanced bushadors like him sometimes use little to no support, only their hands and feet. This is the most dangerous way to climb. In the regional language, it's known as kagang kagang lang, or like a crab. Kasi may mga bato na pag hinawa ka nung bigla na lang buwabagsak. Alvin has had some close calls, and he dislocated his shoulder once. Pag akit ko sa butas, may lumalit yung butas. Dahan-dahan akong bumaba sa kawayan, isang kami na lang inawa ko sa kawayan. Yun na, uminto na talaga ako sa pag-akit ng, 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 sa mga matataas. Nabata Island is completely remote. 
If there's an emergency, there's no way to quickly get help. Namin na rin na disgrasya na sa pagkakyat. Bayaw ko na isa na nalaglag, patay din. Gail! After spotting the nests, Alvin uses a spray bottle filled with water to loosen them. They are then gently peeled away from the cave walls. Yung ibon nun, sa pagwalong piraso yung kugad, ibig sabihin yung ibon niya ay 16. Si partner lagi yan, isang pugad daw ang ibon ka agad yan. Magpartner ka agad yan yung, yung isang pugad. Siguro naman mayroon katulad din ng tao ba <laughs> May poor iba. <laughs> After harvesting, the bouchadors clean them to remove any feathers or branches. Then they divide them by their hardness and color. The local city hall buys the nests from the bouchadors at a regulated price and sells them to private customers around the world. They are the main ingredient in bird's nest soup, a delicacy in China and around the world. A bowl can cost as much as a hundred dollars. Sa tingin ko yung kumakain lang ng soup ng balin sa sayo, yung mga mayayaman lang talaga. Yung mga katulad natin, yung parang wala na lang. In recent years, demand for the nests and bird's nest soup has gone up. Alvin is finally home after two days of hunting for nests. The season is almost over. Kailangan ko ng pagiging isang busyador. Yun na lang eh, kasi hindi naman ako nakapag-aaral, hindi ako nakapagtapos ng pag-aaral. Tapos, unang-una, ayaw ko rin magtrabaho na marayo sa pamilya ko kasi mas, ano na eh, kumikita na rin ako dito sa pagiging busyador. You just watched excerpts from some of our big business and risky business stories. Click here to watch the rest of these videos.